Okay, hello everyone. It's that time, so we'll go ahead and get started and everyone can join in. Good morning or good afternoon, depending where you are today. My name is Amelia Terry. I am part of the Insight South team here at Ponton Industries. Been part of Ponton for just about a year and a half. Thank you for joining us in today's webinar, What Should Matter to the VFD User? Today, we're going to review various medium voltage VFD topologies, many of which are still in use today, as well as the latest developments in medium voltage VFD technology. Before I introduce today's speakers, I would like to go over a few housekeeping items. This webinar is being recorded. You will receive a copy of the recording along with a presentation slice tomorrow afternoon. And also, you all have been muted upon entry. With that said, we'd like to keep this webinar as engaging and interactive as possible. If you have any questions, please use the Q&A section on the left-hand side of your screen. We'll monitor the Q&A section throughout the presentation, but most questions will be answered towards the end of our session. Feel free to use the Q&A section to give us a shout out, tell us what company you are with and what your role is. Today, we have two extraordinary speakers. We'll start with Marty Ponton. Marty is an electrical engineer, the president of Ponton Industries and our VFD product champion. Marty has worked with our guest speaker for over 20 years on several intriguing projects, such as the medium voltage VFD driven linear motor propulsion system for Virgin Hyperloop One and the first medium voltage permanent magnet motor set by a 500 hertz output from a medium voltage VFD. Without any farther delay, let's hear from Marty himself. Hey there, good morning. Um, thank you very much for taking time to attend our webinar. As Amelia mentioned, I am the Variable Frequency Drive Product Champion for Ponton Industries. Our relationship with Siemens and Robocon prior to Siemens acquiring them dates back to 1992. Uh, we're the exclusive Siemens medium voltage drive representative for all of California, as well as Western and Southern Nevada. And we also have Siemens low voltage VFDs for your lower power applications. I'd like to take just a moment to introduce you to Ponton Industries. We were founded by my father in 1970, so we were celebrating our 50th year in business this year. Uh, we offer solutions for most all of your process control and measurement needs. Feel free to visit our website for more information or to discuss your requirement via live chat, uh, or you can send us an email to our info at pontonind.com uh, email address. Today's presentation is the first of a two-part series to present to you the basic information to allow you to pick the appropriate medium voltage VFD for your application. In other words, what should matter to the VFD user? Our goal for this session is to familiarize you with the various medium voltage VFD topologies, their advantages, as well as some areas of concern when applying them to your applications. And I apologize in advance if this topic gets off in the weeds technically a bit, but I think the subject matter is important for you, the user or specifier to understand when selecting the appropriate VFD for your application. The second webinar in our series will be held on Tuesday, July 14th, and will be more specific to applying two of the most commonly used topologies to, today, to today's pumps, fan, and compressor applications. Please note, these two webinars will be recorded and available to you to watch or share later, but you won't receive the link to the webinars automatically if you or your colleagues don't sign up. Lastly, I'd like to mention that we would be happy to provide an in-person lunch and learn at your facility, should that be an allowed venue, or a tailored webinar for just you and your associates to discuss your particular applications. Note, we can accommodate most any uh, presentation platform should your company have a standard platform to um, conduct webinars on. Now, let's get started. Hey, Mark and I have worked on various medium voltage VFD projects, including the two we just met that Amelia mentioned earlier over the past 20, 25 years. But admittedly, I'm just a technical sales engineer. While I can guide you through most of your application commercial questions and uh, application and commercial questions, Mark is the real engineer on this call. I'm going to turn the discussion over to Mark now to introduce himself and start the presentation. Thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm 
broadcasting from the East Coast, so it's just uh, early afternoon here. I, uh, as Marty has indicated, I've been working with him uh, and supporting him in his endeavors for the last uh, quarter century. So um, we've had some interesting applications, but today I want to talk about VFD topologies, uh, what they are and why they might be meaningful to you. At the end of the day, I think most users and people who specify the drives really don't want to be a drives expert. Um, they would like to regard the drive as a black box. And what goes on in, in internal to it is really not as interesting unless it affects certain things in your application or the plant itself. So today I'm going to go through kind of a, a historical perspective of the topologies because they actually do flow in, in a history, an interesting history, and just go through those and point out some of the advantages and disadvantages of these particular drives. The interesting thing is you hear this term topology and it really relates to the power electronics uh, in how it relates to the power electronics in, in BFDs is really the way the parts are arranged or interrelated. Um, you see this is a very simplified uh, block diagram or family tree of drives. And I'm talking about high power drives now here, which are usually 2,400 volts and above. And I'd say about 60 to 80% of our drives in the US are, are usually 4,000 volts or or um, they may be 6,000 or 7,200, but I would say quite a few or 4,000. So these are medium voltage drives. And uh, we will be talking about the various types of drives here. And this is not a complete family tree whatsoever, but uh, it gives you an idea of the basic uh, medium voltage drives. The interesting thing about all these, when you look at them and look at these kind of, you know, odd uh, acronyms and different names, uh, which we will hopefully at the end of this understand. What I want to tell you is every one of these, no matter what we call them, no matter who makes them, they're all made up out of the same six blocks. You will always see these six blocks in every drive that you specify or purchase and have to apply. So when we talk about the topology, we're usually talking about how these six blocks are arranged. And specifically, we're usually talking about the inverter. You will always have a line side filter where the drive connects to the line. Now you might not see it. It may not be a separate box with something in it. It may be incorporated into a transformer or some other kind of magnetic device, which is the second block there. But there will always be some kind of isolation. In most cases, it will be a transformer. Um, generally, it will be some kind of magnetic device and some of it will be a, a choke of some sort. The next block in line, the rectifier, is where we simply turn the AC to DC. We have a DC filter, or sometimes recalled, called the DC link. And then the inverter, which converts everything to AC for the motor. And then an output filter. And once again, on the output filter, you may not see that, but functionally, it'll be incorporated into the inverter or in some manner uh, the way the inverter is functioning. It's, its modulation technique may eliminate the need for an output filter as a separate box, but the function is always there. So no matter whose drive you're talking about, um, you will see these six blocks someplace in the drive or incorporated into some component of the drive. Every drive will always have a rectifier, a DC filter, and an inverter for what we're going to talk about today. So you can see that when people talk about these different topologies and the pluses and minus of these topologies, it's really they're still talking about the same six blocks and how they um, design those and how they implement them. Now, the first thing you notice on that that there's today two basic sort of drives, I, I'll say voltage and current source drives. You can always recognize voltage source drives because the DC link, and this is the capacitor that separates the three, the three phase rectifier you see on the input from the inverter. So these are the three blocks that we saw before. We have the rectifier, the DC link in the terms of a capacitor and the inverter. And in a voltage source, 
Um, they typically have dominated the market today, even though they're, I'm going to say, a later development. And by later, I mean they came into, into use in the 1970s, 1980s. Um, but they had uh, really won the, uh, the, the world over with a high power factor, minimum high order harmonics. Um, they really supply the reactive power of the motor through those capacitors. So they're only pulling real power from the line. So it looks a little bit better on the line. The second type we see is current sources. And today there are two types of current, sor current sources typically used. Now current sources were the very first drives. They were the first drives simply because the very first power electronic device that we could use, the first semiconductors that were available at high power were thyristors or SCRs. And they lent themselves to this topology very well. And since transistors weren't available and they had a, a really good run in the high power area. And we'll see this in a little while uh, LCIs, which are a type of current source are predominant today in, in high power applications above 15 megawatts. Uh, there is a second current source, a CSI or current source inverter, and only one manufacturer makes that today. Uh, they've basically been replaced by voltage sources as a rule. Um, some of the reasons are the power factor is load dependent, meaning that, and speed dependent, meaning as the motor slows down, in speed, the power factor comes down. So the power factor isn't constant like it is in a voltage source. Uh, also efficiency can change as a, as a percentage of speed. And the reactive power is passed right to the motor. So you're not pulling just real power from the line, but you're pulling the total power. And there are some issues with high order harmonics. Now, some of these issues we'll address in the second part of this um, program next month. Uh, when we talk about some of the uh, current source drives and active front ends. But the way to tell a voltage source from a current source is very simple. You look at the component between the rectifier and the inverter. If it's a voltage source, it'll be a capacitor. If it's a current source, it will be a reactor, okay, or an inductor. So you can tell right away just by looking at these which is a voltage source and which is a current source. And what that means when we talk about voltage and current sources is the fact that we are either controlling voltage to the inverter or we're controlling current to the inverter. So that's the only definition. If you're in Europe, you will sometimes hear these referred to as voltage fed or current fed drives. So basic power conversion, and you see the three of the six blocks here, you do see the transformer, but you see the rectification or converter, energy storage or DC link, and then the switching or output section, which is the inverter. You will hear everybody, and myself included, refer to the entire drive as a converter, the entire drive as an inverter. Um, sometimes you will uh, hear people talk about just the rectifier. The rectifier circuit in the front end is considered a converter. And if you go by the strict textbook definitions, the output device, which changes that DC back to AC is the inverter. Now the rectifiers and converters, they're the line side interface. So they, they connect to the line and their, their purpose is to convert fixed frequency, 60 Hertz or 50 Hertz to a fixed voltage um, adjustable, it, that fixed voltage to an adjustable DC voltage or current, depending on whether it's a voltage source or a current source. So that's all that function does, okay? So we're looking at converting the single frequency AC signal to a DC level voltage. The DC link, it's the isolation between that line side and motor side. It's a filter and a storage medium and it tends to isolate the line from the, uh, the motor side. So the line side and motor side are separated by that DC link. And the inverter is the load side interface that attaches to the motor. And it converts the DC from the DC link into an adjustable frequency and adjustable voltage um, so that we can change the speed of the motor 
and recognize the cost savings associated with offering operating at a lower speed um, and take advantage of affinity laws to reduce our utility costs. Now, the interesting thing about this, and I want to mention it because uh, you'll hear these terms as we go forward, is you may hear the term pulse count. Pulse count refers to the line side of the drive. So the rectifier or converter, depending on its configuration with the isolation transformer, will have a certain pulse count. Pulses do virtually nothing to the motor side. So you can have a six pulse, a 12 pulse, an 18 pulse, 24 pulse, or 36 pulse input, which tells you that the harmonics uh, tells gives you an indication of the harmonics will be driven by the configuration of the rectifier or converter. It will do nothing to the motor. So that is separate and most of the line side uh, performance will be driven by the kind of conductor converter you have on the front end of your drive. The inverter will drive the performance on the motor. So these are basically two separate circuits, although they may physically be located close together in some topologies, they're not in all, but um, they will affect different parts of the system. The converter will affect the performance of the drive on the line side, the inverter will, will, will drive the performance uh, of the drive in terms of the motor side. And usually the performance on the inverter side is referred to, one of the things it's referred to, its performance is the number of levels. So when you hear the term pulse count, you're always talking about the line side and the higher the pulse count, the less harmonics that you would expect to see on the line side and the better the performance in terms of affecting your utility or your plant grid. When you hear the term levels, multi-level, that refers to the motor side. And once again, the higher the number of levels, the more benign or the easier the drive is on the motor side. So let's talk a little bit about uh, each one of these for a few minutes and then we'll move on because we're going to play really pay more attention to the inverter, but the role of the line side converter is to not affect the plant grid. So we have standards, uh, primarily IEEE 519, which says that you cannot distort the plant power by more than 5%. And that will be either done with pulse counts or it could be done with an active uh, front end. But typically the pulse count on a, um, on most voltage sources will be done with some kind of magnetic device. The other thing that is specified and what we have to be careful of is we don't want to affect the power factor uh, too severely. So you might, might expect that with a transformer on the front end or some magnetic device that you always want to operate between 0.95 um, and higher uh, power factor. And obviously with a, an active front end, you might actually be able to operate at unity power factor. But most of these drives have ways of operating. Now somebody may come back to you and say, well, the IEEE 519 doesn't refer to the input of the drive. It refers to the point of common coupling. And that's true. But today, in today's market, every drive should be able to meet 519 at the input of the drive. There are various ways to do it. The multiple transformers, the most common way, but it can be done with filters. It can be done in a number of ways. But the reason for that is so that you as a user or as somebody who is specifying or a contractor who's working in a plant, you can put in a drive that you know meets I5, IEEE 519 at the input of the drive to eliminate the need to do any kind of analysis to see if input uh, installing that drive will affect the plant grid. Now there's no guarantee because you don't know what the plant grid necessarily looks like. And as the line or the plant gets weaker, it doesn't really matter what um, you might be able to do because you might find that you're getting some distortion um, that can be affected by these. But as a rule in a normal plant with the way IEEE 519 is specified, you should be able to meet those requirements at the input of the drive. And the DC 
the DC, the rectifier or the converter will drive whether you can do that, that configuration. So if you're familiar with low voltage drives, you can start to get an idea of at least three of the parts that we talked about. Once again, you can see the rectifier, you can see the three phase AC signal in. On the one side, on the left side of the DC link, you can see the ripple voltage. On the right side, as you might imagine, there's some filtering, so it's a nice DC signal. And then what the modulation technique or switching signals do is turn on various transformers. We want current to flow out to the motor through two of the phases and come back in another phase. So we turn on alternate transformers to allow that current to flow. And we switch those in a technique called pulse width modulation to give us an idea of, uh, or kind of simulate a waveform. The pink waveform here is a pulse width modulated voltage. The current is this jagged red waveform you here, see here, which looks sinusoidal. We're more concerned about the current uh, since that's what's generating our losses. When I say more concerned, I'm talking about I squared R losses um, and harmonics. Uh, we do have concerns about this voltage, which we'll talk about. But in the early days, this is a classic low voltage drive, and this is how it operates. And you see these square waves here. And when we first came out with transistors and started applying them to low voltage drives, or low voltage motors, we all of a sudden found out we were failing a lot of these motors. And you could see um, how this works, uh, you know, as I just described. So we couldn't figure out why these uh, motors were failing all of a sudden when we were putting on what basically is a, um, what we would call a two level uh, inverter, because we're switching between the DC plus, plus rail and the DC minus rail. So you can see, Transistor turns on and we ride at, if this was 480 volts or 4160 volts, whatever it was, it would switch up to the 4000 volt level. And then when we alternate it, it would switch down to minus 4000. So this is the simulated voltage waveform here. So in the early days, we this phenomena would drive what was eventually required for inverter grade motors. So this is really how every drive works. We're converting AC to DC, filtering it DC to AC. And every drive, no matter what voltage it's operating on, is operating the same way. Now the topology, the way we put these things together, uh, we uh, will determine the topology, but pr primarily the topology will be determined by the inverter, because there are a lot of different arrangements that you can use in the converter or rectifier, but they're generally all the same for these systems. They'll be set up for 12, 18, 24 pulse. They'll use some kind of isolation transformer. And in the only case where these aren't used, um, we use an active front end, which we'll talk about in the second portion of this, uh, this training. So as I mentioned, this is the same uh, same family tree you saw. The one thing I want to stress, and um, I didn't, I should have probably mentioned it at the beginning. Although I do work for Siemens, this presentation I am going out of my way because I don't I don't like to um, say, well, this drives good, this drives bad. Um, every one of these exists, and they still exist today to some extent because they all have advantages and disadvantages. The thing to remember is you can pick any one of these drives and you should pick it based on the best performance it gives you based on what you, the user, or you, your application needs. But keep in mind, nothing is free. Uh, and when I say that, I'm not talking about cost necessarily, but what happens is if you look for a, a relatively simple drive, uh, you may, it may cost less, it may be easier to operate, but the efficiency may not be as good. So you end up paying for those losses over a period of time. So everything has a trade-off, nothing's free. So as I talk about these, I hope that I don't sound too negative about some of them, but from a historical spec perspective, you can start to look at these. And now this is a very simplified pro, you know, family tree, but I made a another one because this shows what's available in the market today. 
Um, we're going to talk a little bit about direct drives over here on the left hand side at the end of this because they're very, very special and there aren't too many of those around. But most of the drives we all deal with today are DC link drives. So they're, as I mentioned, are either voltage source or current source. And there's a new one out now, a distributed voltage source. As a rule, if you look down through here, the current sources, as I mentioned, the, the white block boxes you see are still drives that are currently available on the market. Now, LCIs are produced by many people for large pow high power applications above 15 megawatts. CSIs are produced by one manufacturer today. Uh, and most everybody has switched over to voltage sources be for a very number of reasons. And you'll kind of get that feeling. Now, we just looked at the two-level voltage source, and I'm going to go through that in a little bit more detail because it serves as the basis for what everybody has tried to do since the 1970s. If you look at this chart, and I hope you can see my cursor here, but if you look at the NPC, and don't be worried about these acronyms, you'll understand what they mean at the end, even though it's kind of trivial pursuit sort of knowledge. NPCs are neutral point clamps, and you start to see these three level, four level, five level, and then you all of a sudden get into multi-level. Remember, the number of levels determines how that drive interacts with the motor. So in a very real sense, the history of medium voltage drive development is a search for higher and higher levels on the output. So what has happened since 1970 is in the 1970s is that people came up with an NPC. And if we go from left to right on this lower tier down here, you can see these three level NPC, three level active NPC, these different, you could see the levels are going up because as the levels went up, the, uh, the ability to have higher and higher performance with the motor dynamically and also allowing you to use these drives on industrial motors that were not inverter grade became the quest for everybody's development. So I'd like to tell you that people still produce NPCs. We produce NPCs, everyone does, a number of people do. Um, we also produce some, uh, some cascaded H bridges, which are a, a multi-level drive. And then there's a new distributed voltage source. And again, if you would look across here, all the levels keep going up, indicating that the drive is much more benign to the motor and allows the motor to operate a standard motor. The yellow boxes are drives that were either, well, the two level would never was never a legitimate um, approach to medium voltage, but the four level flying capacitor was, was tried out by Alstom and they're yellow because they never really, um, it became commercially commercially viable. It's still around um, if you're dealing with some of, uh, I know there are some, some European and Asian um, manufacturers who are still trying to make the flying capacitor work. We'll spend a few minutes on it, but it's never been commercially viable. I put it in there because it's an interesting name that you don't see very often. And you can see it was an attempt to get more levels in the output, but it, it turned out to be very difficult to control. So you can see as you go across the voltage source um, family here that we go from a relatively simple, modestly performing drive that as you might imagine was reasonably, you know, reasonably priced. And as you went across this lower tier, the drives became more complex, more higher performance, they didn't need uh, other equipment. They were they could be put on they could be retrofitted on industrial grade motors, um, and it was all associated with making that inverter section um, more and more complex, more higher performing, and as you might imagine, probably cost more as well. So the history of the topology has been the quest for higher and higher output levels to attach to the motor. So let's go through the two level inverter very quickly. We just talked about it. And um, you can see in the upper right-hand corner, I hope you can see my cursor, this is a typical low voltage drive. Now we've removed the DC rectifier. The converter is not shown here. So the DC comes in, 
you can see this is a voltage source because of the capacitor. And then we have our three legs running the motor. And you can see the waveform is, as I mentioned before, a pulse width modulated waveform, which simulates the voltage. Now, the actual, as we know, I, I always usually in a classroom setting is ask how, how many people are electrical or mechanical, because we people working in a lot of the utilities uh, or you know, municipalities or uh, different applications, manufacturing applications are, are process engineers, mechanical engineers, industrial engineers. So they may not be um, as familiar with these waveforms as, as the electrical engineers are, but electrical engineers know that when you have a square wave like this, we're turning transistors on and off. They don't, they don't look like this signal here. They actually look like this waveform down below, and you can see that uh, things don't shut off right away. They overshoot, you get spikes, and you can see these spikes throughout the waveform. And when we first started developing drives for low voltage, we put these on standard motors, and these spikes, and you can see on the very lowest waveform here, it's blown up. This happens to be a 4,000 volt motor, but you can see every time we switch, we actually get closer to 4,800 volts. So we're seeing a 4,800 volt spike um, and it doesn't destroy the motor or damage the motor right away, but over time it can stress the insulation and uh, cause a premature failure, reduce the life of the drive. So if you wanted to implement this low voltage drive that you see up here in a medium voltage world, it could be done as you see in the lower right hand corner here. This is a medium voltage two level inverter. And what you see is a number of devices in series to support the voltage. So these three devices serve the purpose of one transformer at one transistor. So this is a two level medium voltage inverter. It's not practical because there aren't motors that can tolerate switching from 4,000 volts to minus 4,000 volts, unless it's an inverter grade medium voltage motor. And there are some other issues associated with this too, we'll talk about. But this is how a two level medium voltage drive works. So we're gonna turn on this set of S1 transistors. We're gonna turn on S4 and S6, um, and we will allow current to flow out to the motor and two legs and back in one of the uh, other legs. And depending on how we turn these transistors on, these six transistors on, we will modulate it to give us a certain voltage and a certain frequency, which would allow us to change the speed of the motor. So keep this in mind. It's a real simple circuit, especially if you're familiar with low voltage. But for the next decade after the 70s, a lot actually two decades, a lot of work was done with this circuit to come up with a way that would allow us to operate on a standard industrial motor as opposed to a inverter grade motor because inverter grade motors were expensive. Now, talking about inverter grade motors, if you look at the signals on a low voltage PWM, um, and, you know, this circuit is the standard circuit for low voltage. Its uh, advantage was it's very inexpensive. And with IGBTs, um, you know, the switching frequency, of the IGBTs was high enough that it didn't uh, cause any problems to the motor. The big issue, though, was the change in voltage, the step voltage itself. Not only was there overshoot, but that high, fast moving wave front created problems on the motor stator winding. It would be impressed across the few, the first few end turns, and that could cause damage to the insulation system on the, uh, on the first, first few turns of the winding. Um, there was also common mode voltage, uh, which was a really uh, strong or powerful source of EMI. And the transistors to build medium voltage circuits at the time weren't available. You could make a two level inverter today if you had high enough voltage switches, but they again don't exist just yet. But this is the building block for most of the medium voltage drives available today. Okay, so understanding how it works 
will help us understand how the medium voltage systems work. The inverter topology, as I mentioned, was a quest for additional output levels. And you start to get a sense of it here. You look at the three level output, and you've heard me talk about it as a two level. And this is something I'll clarify. It can be confusing because people will call their drives two level, not anymore, but they'll either call them three level, five level, seven level, 13 level. It's, it's a, you know, it can be very confusing. The two level or lower number is the line to neutral number of levels. The higher number, five, in this case, three and five, is line to line. And we're typically more concerned with the line to line to line to neutral. So you can see every time we changed the topology, and these are various inverter topologies across the top, the first four at least, um, we got more and more levels of output. And that meant, and if you look at the very first three level system with just the two ratcheting between plus and minus voltage, then all of a sudden you went to five level and you could see the various steps. The first thing you notice is this looks much more sinusoidal. And as we add steps, we get more and more sinusoidal. The steps get smaller, so the DVDT goes down, which means there's less insulation stress. The steps get smaller, so the peak voltage, the overshoot is less. So there's less insulation stress on the motor. And those of us who remember Fourier analysis uh, in the distant past know that the number of harmonics associated with a square wave are much, much higher than a sinusoidal. So as these systems, these signals get a sinusoidal, the harmonics goes down. So there's less motor heating. And if you are familiar with inverter grade motors, the two things that are different about it versus a standard motor is the fact that a standard motor, um, its insulation system will be beefed up to make it inverter grade. It'll go to a higher level and that usually sometimes makes it slightly larger. And also the metal housing will get larger to dissipate the heat. So that's what the difference is between an inverter grade motor and an output motor. But the idea here is by increasing the number of levels on the output, we lower peak voltages, we lower the DVD-T levels. We come up with a way of dealing with common mode voltage to eliminate bearing currents. Um, so that there aren't any premature bearing failures uh, due to currents flowing through it and pitting uh, the bearings. So that's the history of the development of drives that have gone on over the last probably 50 years. Now I mentioned you'll see current sources, the CSI here, and you could see from a voltage standpoint, this is a two level, um, a three level converter. Uh, but it's current that's being controlled versus voltage. But um, these have problems that are similar to the two level or three level system. So you can see these two systems uh, are problematic potentially. There are ways to resolve the issues and I'll show you those. But this is also a reason why most people have moved away from the current source drives to some form of voltage source drives. These, as I said, only one manufacturer makes a CSI at this point in time, um, you know, really successfully. So let's start with the NPC. This is the oldest topology in the voltage source. And, uh, you know, the, um, we want to recognize this circuit. You recognize it right away because you have the capacitors here and you have your six transistor pairs. Okay, so there's multiple transistors, but think of each one of these as a single transistor. And you see that over here too. So you can start to see the one, two, three, four, five, six transistors. But in this case, you notice that the DC bus here has been cut in half and it's clamped with diodes. Hence the name, we create an artificial neutral point by cutting the DC bus in half and clamping it with diodes, neutral point clamp. That's where that name comes from. And the first thing it did, we went from, and I'm gonna to try to use the line to line now for consistency. So we went from a three level inverter that was very damaging to motors and couldn't actually be used on motors without having the motor be an inverter grade motor to a five level. So we went from three to five levels 
by just adding this arrangement of clamping the neutral point uh, and creating a neutral point on the DC bus. Okay, so right off the bat, this was, just, was a big improvement. So we now have not only the plus and minus DC bus, but half of the DC bus. And uh, the only thing we've had to do is add six diodes and split the DC links. So it's very, very easy to do. Um, this can be implemented with a wide variety of devices, so it's fairly flexible. And, um, you know, uh, the, um, you can see this is set up with a diode front end. Uh, six, this is set up as a 12 pulse system. You see the two rectifiers here. And um, it, will, it can be set up uh, with regeneration, but uh, I'll take a minute here and digress. I know Marty is gonna cringe when I say that because we lose time, but just so you know, the converter front end that we see here, the diodes are set up as two six pulse diodes, like uh, you, know, you would see on a low voltage system, a single six pulse. The transformer is a multi-phase shifting transformer. So you see the Y and delta windings here. These are phase shifted with respect to each other and they cancel the harmonics. So this is called a 12 pulse arrangement. It's very easy to calculate the pulse count that you get on the output here, because if you have two phase shifts, feeding to, uh, each feeding a six pulse rectifier, it's two times six. If we added a third phase shift here and a third transformer, it would be three times six for an 18 pulse. A little history here, about 20 years ago, there was a nefarious sort of, you know, uh, salesperson someplace who said, you can meet IEEE 519 with 12 pulse. It's absolutely untrue, but you can meet it with 18 pulse as long as you have a very balanced and stiff input line which is the case most of the time. But as our utilities change, um, the 18 pulse is right on the margin. It can actually, it's usually about 4%, 4.5%. And we know the uh, of distortion and we know IEEE needs 5%. I would say today, most people have standardized on 24 pulse because if you look at 24 pulse, um, you can tolerate any kind of line, not any, but the typical line unbalance and weakness that we're starting to see in the utility grids. But that converter being separate from the inverter can be a number of things. It could be a 12 pulse, an 18 pulse, 24 pulse on these types of systems. And that's one of the advantages in that you can separate the rectifier and the transformer from the converter. And that might be um, a good way to go if you're looking at putting these in a tight spot or you're looking at minimizing HVAC to cool the drive, these types of things as you start to look at. But you could say this was the very first um, kind of uh, change to the two level inverter, which actually opened up the medium voltage market to drives. Um, and this NPC was the very first one. And you can see the voltage levels we now have, the five levels, plus half, zero, minus, and minus DC. So, so it was a real nice arrangement. And you can kind of see the waveform here. So, and you can count the levels. So you can see one, two, three, four, five levels. So that's where that level comes from. And the fact that it looks more sinusoidal starts to, it should give you a sense that this is going to be easier on the motor, but this is still pretty difficult for an industrial motor to handle. And most of these systems will require some kind of filtering on the output to slow down these, these fast moving wave fronts and limit uh, peaking so that the motor will be able to tolerate this waveform. So the neutral point clamp as it existed in the 70s and 80s, it was very efficient. It was able to be equipped with uh, an AFE. It was a flexible footprint because you could separate the rectifier and the transformer. And it was very easy to control. And think of those the microprocessors that are available in those days were not particularly, um, you know, certainly, you know, were uh, much simpler. So this worked out very well. The problem with the NPC, if you want to call it that, or the trade-offs, I should say the trade-offs, not the problem, because everyone still makes an NPC. Siemens does, everyone makes them, because they're a nice, solid uh, drive. Um, 
they have poor loss distribution, so they sometimes can be a little bit tricky in terms of cooling, which can stress the capacitors and some other things. They have poor uh, THD compliance for the uh, motor uh, in that they still produce a fair amount of harmonics and need some kind of output filtering to make sure the motor is protected. There's no redundancy of possible in this circuit. So if one piece fails, a diode, a transistor, the whole drive shuts down. So the reliability um, is not quite as high as we can achieve in some of the other topologies. And as I said, there's a low number of levels. It's a great improvement from three, but it's three to five. And um, it's still not good enough to use a um, industrial motor without some kind of filtering. And I mentioned something here too. Um, we don't have enough time to get into some of the system issues, but sometimes efficiency is a big issue with our customers uh, and your customers. You might find people want a certain efficiency. And the problem is as you add components like an output filter, that will tend to degrade the efficiency that is a component that's going to carry current and it will degrade the efficiency not by much but a lot of these systems over time if even a half a percent or two tenths of a percent efficiency loss um, could add up to thousands of dollars over the life of the drive so one of the things that's being is driving design today is higher higher efficiencies and you see the devices themselves the semiconductors um, are getting much, much more efficient. And I want to say something, um, in my opinion, anyone, anytime you see someone tell you that their drive is 98% efficient um, or greater, they are talking about just the inverter section. And they're, they're not lying, they're tr that's true. Uh, matter of fact, some of these inverter sections can be 99% efficient at the new devices that are available. The problem is the user will never see that because you have to include output filters, you have to include the rectifiers, the transformer losses if you have it. So, you know, claiming 98 or 99% efficiency is, um, is not necessarily, um, you know, an out and out lie, but it's not practical because you have to use this within the entire system. Um, most systems today, when you include everything, will, between, will be between 96 and maybe 97, a little higher than 97% if they do some special things. But you're not going to get too much better than that. Even with um, a transformerless, so-called transformerless design, um, the efficiency will not be considerably greater. That being said, there are some advantages to removing the transformer in terms of relocating it outside your control room so you don't need HVAC and things like this. But, you know, that's, a, again, a system level discussion. So some of these topologies lend themselves to that. So we went from a two level unusable system, or I'll say three level unusable system to a five level system that's worked, that worked very well and is still produced today, okay? couple things about this and you can kind of see the voltage and the current. And the current is still, you know, a little bit uh, wavy, a little bit distorted. Um, this system has been used in um, mills and in steel applications where they have a common DC bus because you can attach them to the DC bus. You can install the transformer separately so it's out of your control room. And the power switches, the semiconductors, which are the weakest link in any drive, potentially, uh, the count is relatively low. But this waveform means that you cannot have very long cable app, uh, cables between the motor and the drive. So you will potentially require an output reactor and certainly a filter um, between the drive and the motor. Again, I mentioned redundancy is not available. And even at this level, five levels, the insulation system of the motor has to be checked to make sure it can tolerate the DVDT. And most of these will require an output sine well, a wave filter of some sort, which will tend to reduce the efficiency. And you can see that here. This is a legitimate schematic here. So you see we have two rectifiers here, 12 pulse system. You see the two capacitors make up the DC link and the common point here and you see the diode clamps. So as soon as you see this common point, you know you're dealing with an NPC, then you can see the filter required on the output. 
so that we can use a standard motor. So the filter on the output can, can decrease our efficiency. There's some other issues associated with that as well, but you know, in the interest of time, we'll take a look here. Um, then we decided that uh, if I can use an NPC on one, you know, for a motor, if I break it down and actually put them in series and put one NPC circuit per leg, I can actually increase this to nine levels. So I can go from five levels to nine levels, almost double the number of levels. And it's very modular. There's a single NPC cell in each phase. You get nine levels, which is really, um, you know, improving things greatly uh, for the motor. The only problem with this particular system was that it required 3,300 volt IGBTs. And um, it's not a problem in terms of, um, operation, it's just availability. Sometimes these can be difficult to obtain. There aren't very many people making those that voltage level transistor. And, and you notice I put oil-filled DC link capacitors. These actually use, most of the commercial ones available today use film caps and they're oil-filled. If you're working with a utility, um, the utilities are the ones I know most, uh, they will not allow oil-filled capacitors, though, but you can get film capacitors in gas, gas filled. Um, the oil is not particularly caustic, it's a mineral oil, but it's still considered an environmental problem in, in the utilities. And I'm not sure if municipalities or anyone else would have a similar idea, but just be aware of it. So um, there was a little bit of concern over those, but it's been you know, really mitigated, I think, in most cases with gas uh, films. Uh, there are some limitations on voltage uh, on these, and it's not because there's any particular limitation um, other than the IGBT availability, but uh, people have stuck it, uh, you know, for the U.S. market at 4160. It does come with an integral transformer, and it's usually set up for with a 24 pulse rectifier as opposed to the 18 pulse you see in the diagram there. And you can see the step voltage is about 1800 volts. So many times you will see people say it needs an optional output filter for DVDT because 1800 is a pretty good step um, and, and you can damage the end turns of the stator winding. Because we use film caps, there is a pre-charge circuit which reduces the inrush. The film capacitors, um, again, you get nothing for free. So when you go to a film cap, it has the advantage of being self-healing, but they're very sensitive to voltage transients. So they cannot be started without a pre-charge. They have to be charged um, prior to power being fully applied to the drive. So you need another circuit for it. I don't consider that a necessary negative because as our utilities, as the uh, grid gets weaker or softer um, due to the changes in our utility practices, um, you know, this, this actually could be a positive thing. We basically took that same NPC circuit we just talked about, put one in each leg, and now we have nine levels. And uh, this can actually, uh, you know, uh, be a very nice arrangement. And you can see the different levels. You see the waveform is much, much more sinusoidal. You can also see you have a lot more flexibility on how you set up the um, number of pulses because the number of phase shifts on the transformer now can make this up to a 36 pulse system. And, you know, I mentioned 24 pulses is, is more than adequate for anything that would happen on our grids. 36 pulses is, is that's doesn't mean it's twice as good, but it, uh, it, it is certainly reduces the harmonic content and relieves you the, of con general concern over what's happening when you apply this drive. So it does have a, a nice um, cost position, easy to control, highly efficient. This one, you can't really do an AFE. So you can't do any kind of uh, active front end, which we'll talk about in the next um, system. There is a slight issue with, uh, with the THD, but, but not too much with this. Uh, and again, the big issue here is there's no real redundancy. You see all of these are kind of derivative of the original NPC. So any failure on any one of these will cause the system to trip. There are a couple of different types of derivatives of the neutral point clamp. Um, you recognize the circuit here on the far left. There's an active 
neutral point clamp where you can see the diode that clamps the uh, neutral point has as an additional trans transistor in it and you can see what a practical circuit looks like and you can see there's a little bit of a snubber circuit that goes into this um, so we're replacing the diodes with active switches and it actually increases the efficiency of the overall inverter it reduces the stress on the transistors and it also provides a nine level output okay so it was it was a nice arrangement this is um, a system that a number of people make um, it has better output distortion you know improved uh, output distortion um, again power drive re device redundancy is not available it may require an output fat reactor or filter for long cables and again you just have to check the system on this one the motor on this one for dvdt the sine wave filters for these tend to be very very small easy to fit in the drive because there's more levels and in this particular case with this arrangement the transformer has to be installed fairly close to the drive so they tend to be either integral or very very close the big issue here is there are almost twice as many semiconductors required um, to implement the, the nine systems you have here. So only one vendor right now uses an active neutral point clamp. I don't know how long they'll be doing that because they've gone through a number of, they've been bought by a number of different people and uh, I don't see this as, as something you'll see very often. There is a neutral point pilot topology. This was an old Alstom design where you can see we have back-to-back -back transistors that were installed, but this is still, you see the neutral point on the DC bus, you still see the uh, clamping diodes. Now the clamping diodes again have been replaced with a different arrangement of transistors. And this is called a neutral point pilot. Um, this was actually developed in 77. It really didn't go very many places. Matter of fact, Alstom, as I, under, as I recall, is the only one who ever really used this. Um, it increased the number of IGBTs and the control was a little bit more difficult. Uh, it didn't really improve anything uh, dramatically um, because you still needed output filters, but it did have uh, some advantages to the manufacturer in that uh, you know, it would allow switching losses to go down. So the drive tended to be a little bit more efficient, but with the additional devices, that efficiency was, was kind of swamped out. And it also allowed um, higher switching frequencies, uh, which made the output filter slightly smaller. So, you know, it was an interesting um, topology. It was only made by one vendor. I don't think they're still making it or they still have it, but they may not be focused on that one just yet. But you can see all these neutral point systems uh, were aimed at increasing the number of levels. Well, we, we ran away there. Okay. I, I'm just going to mention this in passing. Alstom in France developed uh, a flying capacitor and uh, it was never commercially available or realizable. You can see the levels and the waveform, and you can see how that circuit looks. It's quite a bit different. Um, they could never figure out uh, a control that would control, you know, be able to maintain uh, circulating currents, so the capacitors were difficult to size and keep alive. Uh, I have seen some companies in Japan that are still playing with this, but no one's commercially bought it. I just mentioned it in, in passing. So that brings us to the cascaded H bridge. This is a power cell and you recognize the circuit right away as a three phase rectifier, the DC link, and you see your four devices here. And it's a three, you know, if we added another set of devices, this would be a classic low voltage drive, but it's set up as a single phase, two level inverter. So we're just turning on these alternate transistors to generate one system, one, one level. And these are put in series. And depending on how many you have, you can determine however many levels you want. So you can get very, very high number of levels. <coughs> Excuse me. The problem is you need a lot of them. So as I mentioned, 
now you can get the superior performance. You don't need an output waveform, output filter. You get a lot of advantages to this on the motor. You don't have to worry about damaging the motor. Um, there are a lot of performance improvements, but this is a much more complex system. And this is what's available today. It's called an H bridge because you can see this is one leg of the H, this is the second leg of the H, and the load goes in between. So this is where that term comes from. They're cascaded because they're placed in series, okay? So this is the modern, uh, I guess, Siemens Perfect Harmony Drive, but you should realize there are about 40 vendors making clones of this today. It is the most it is the most installed, has the highest installed base of any particular topology. There's over 16,000 of these in the field, and there are over 40 people making clones right now. So this was first designed or patented in the 1990s, mid-1990s, and each, each cell is fed from a winding, so you can get as, as many pulses as you want, depending on, on the number of cells that you pick. And each module is self-contained. It's a single phase PWM drive. Um, so you can get extremely low input current harmonics. So that filter that I mentioned that you will always have, you don't need a filter with this because it's embedded, the function is embedded in the transformer. Of course, that's true of any drive that uses a multi-phase transformer. The input fact power factor is uniformly high. It's usually about 0.95 across the uh, usable speed range. Um, the cells are switching at uh, a low rate, so the losses are quite low in these, but because they're in series, you can get superior performance in terms of um, that switching frequency not making its way out to the motor or not impacting the motor. <clears throat> Each output step is 1,000 volts versus the 1,800 we saw before, so the DVD-T is minimized. And as I said, no output filter is required. And you get an idea of these. This is a 21 level. So we've been talking about five and nine level. And all of a sudden, with this system, you can get 21 levels. Um, and sometimes even higher. Um, not all of them are 21 levels. It depends on the number of cells. So the cascaded H bridge has a very good loss distribution, very good total harmonic distortion to the motor, and it uses low voltage components because these are low voltage systems. It is difficult but not impossible to put an AFE on this. There are larger systems that do have active front ends where the diodes are replaced with transistors. The transformer is an integral transformer. It's very difficult to separate it out because of the number of cables between the transformer and the drive. So it can be done, but very difficult. And um, so it's typically integral, which means that you can't separate that transformer. So the losses of the transformer are in the control room. Um, and it can have, with all of these, they can have slightly lower efficiency but with the trench gate technology, with silicon carbon uh, carbide, there are a lot of semiconductor devices, whereas each power cell now has, um, is about 90, 98.5% efficient, um, but you have a lot of them. So, you know, there's a, you know, there's a slight efficiency sacrifice here. So as I mentioned, the voltage source evolution has gone from neutral point clamps there's the flying capacitor to the cascaded H bridge. This is kind of the evolution of what's happening. We've gone from three to five to nine levels on the neutral point clamp uh, up to where we have on the lowest end, really um, uh, 11 levels uh, all the way up to, uh, you know, possibly, uh, um, you know, 21 levels. So very, very benign on the motor, but it's a much more complex system. So you have more levels, less distortion, much more motor friendly. There is generally an increase in efficiency over drives that were produced earlier and increased reliability. The power cell modular approach allows a power cell to be bypassed. 
so you can continue to operate this in the event of any failure within the cell, a transistor, a diode, circuit board. So the reliability of this more complex system and the higher performance sometimes justifies the slight increase in cost. So those are the voltage sources that are available today. I'm going to go through the current sources really quickly. The, the niche current source, the LCI, or current source drives, usually use thyristors or uh, con gate controlled thyristors on the diode, replacing the diodes. And then they also use, they can use um, gate comm commutated thyristors or GTOs on the, uh, on the output. So the DC link you see is, a, is an inductor. So this is a current source. And the uh, GTOs or SGCTs are used in the inverter section. These will always have some kind of filtering on the output, okay? Always. Um, and again, when you see filtering on the output, you know the levels, the potential damage to the motor that has to be there to protect the motor. Okay, and you kind of get a sense of these LCIs. LCIs are load commutated inverters because you need a separate excitation from the motor to commutate off the SCRs. So these load commutated inverters can only be used with synchronous machines. They cannot be used with induction machines. And you kind of see the signal here. And, and as you look at that, you can guess that it's going to be very, very rich in harmonics. And that's really the issue with these. Uh, it is a current fed circuit. Uh, very, very popular in Europe and with larger systems, but it needs a synchronous machine. Um, just a note, sometimes if you're used to uh, using a synchronous machine as a condenser to for power factor correction in your plant, once you put it on a drive, you lose that capability. So you have to be a little bit careful. Um, the motor has to be a little bit special to operate with an LCI. So when you order the synchronous motor, you have to make sure the motor manufacturer knows it's going to be on an LCI. Um, and they have to make sure that they can provide the, uh, you know, the reactive power uh, of the converter to um, commutate off. It's rich in harmonics, so sometimes there's derating, but it also requires that output filter. Um, and they um, are most commonly used in high power medium voltages, above 15 megawatts. There also is some concern over torque pulsations because what's happening is your rectifier, uh, I don't know if any of, uh, any of us on the phone have um, done any work with AM or superhet radios, these units in the rectifier, these devices and units are, are commutating on and off at 60 hertz. These might be commutating on and off at a different frequency because we're running the motor at a different speed. Well, when you have two different frequencies like that, you can get a beat frequency that some kind is low enough that can excite a torsional resonance on the motor. These tend to be big, so the torsional resonances tend to be a little bit lower. So there is some concern. The one big thing about these though, they are four quadrant operations. So you can pass power back to the line and effectively break the motor or slow it down. So that's a big positive. These tend to be standard 12 pulse, although you can get 24 pulse arrangements and you get an idea of how these are set up. The inductor DC link reactor is sometimes a very special reactor designed to handle common mode issues. And these are not small. You can get a rough idea. Here's your DC link reactor that we were talking about. You get an idea of the waveforms, which are, are quite, um, you know, quite rich in harmonics. It's moderate cost. It's efficient, reliable. In many marine applications, you'll see that they'll use these types of drives because they've been around for a long time and their failure modes are very benign. Okay. And these were some of the first drives. Um, you can have redundant devices in series, but here we go. We were talking about distortions at 5%. The output current distortion is 25%. So some type of filtering is going to be required on the output. The input harmonics can be as high as 30%. So it has to be filtered. Remember, IEEE 519 says 5%. So this is a drive that because of the way it's configured, it has poor harmonic distortion, requires filtering 
on both the fronts and the backs. And a lot of times you'll see these with fifth and seventh harmonic traps. It has poor power factor. It usually tracks the uh, power factor will, will decrease with speed and so will the efficiency. It's very difficult to operate below 10% speed, um, but the synchronous motors uh, were, um, you know, had to be specialized even though they were low maintenance. But today um, people can make induction machines in this range that are just as efficient as the synchronous machines and they don't need to use this kind of drive. There's high common mode voltage on the motor, therefore it's almost always used with a transformer. Uh, this has a very high degree of reliability, as I mentioned, but it's really suitable only for output ratings above 15 megawatts. These can go up to uh, 75, 80,000 horsepower in, in, uh, in many systems. Uh, they can only operate synchronous machines. You can get redundancy, so again, they get very reliable. Um, 150 hertz is is interesting, but usually won't see that kind of speed on these large machines. Um, there is a um, interesting DC link reactor design, as I mentioned, that can be used. Um, they can set this up with 24 pulse, but inner harmonics, that beat frequency I mentioned, can cause problems with uh, torque, tra torque pulsation. So there is a lot more analysis that's associated with applying these types of drives. Uh, and obviously the harmonics associated with this uh, can sometimes cause losses in the machine, but they're pretty heavily filtered. And to give you an idea of how heavily filtered, this is a typical LCI filter that's indoors. So you get an idea of the magnitude of it. And here's one that's outdoors. So these are associated with, uh, with these drives. So you can see they're really geared for very high power applications. The CSI drive, as I mentioned, only one, one manufacturer makes this right now. It looks very similar to the LCI, but instead of using, um, it uses a different type of device on the output, which allows it to commutate off. So this can be used with synchronous and induction machines. Again, it's a fairly old drive, uh, 72, but uh, it uses very inexpensive parts. Uh, it's not very hard to design, but there are some concerns. You have to uh, oversize certain certain components, particularly magnetic components, because when you look at these waveforms, um, the magnetic components have to be uh, rated uh, differently to uh, tolerate that. It's um, still competitive above 5,000 horsepower, but um, typically you will not see this used too often below that. Um, most of the voltage source drives are just a lot more competitive and a lot easier to use at the, you know, below that. Um, it does have regenerative capability. So if you need to break the motor in terms of uh, slowing it down, you can, but you do get the idea here of what that output looks like. And you see the, the type of filters that are required on the output to protect the motor when you're using these types of drives. And this is one of the primary reasons people have moved away from the CSI is you need a lot of auxiliary equipment to make sure you protect the motor. And there are some safety issues associated with these and self-exciting the motor. So there are some problems with this. Um, I think um, one of the things uh, that I wanted to point out on here this goes through how this operates, um, and as I said, it's it's uh, there's only one of them, one one manufacturer at this point, so it's not that common. Um, it can be set up with a DC chopper if you have a common DC bus, but um, one of the things I wanted to mention here is by using GTOs, you still have output filtering of some sort, but you can see we've improved the output waveform. So it looks like an LCI, but you could see GTOs or gate, gate operated um, thyristors. You could see there are some additional circuits required. It's still necessary to filter this um, to make sure you're protecting the motor. Um, the big issue with this type of arrangement that you see, and again, one of the reasons why people have moved away from it, is this filter creates some issues. The filter can self-excite the motor even when the VFD is turned off. 
which can create a safety issue and you can't operate this without the filter. So this can also, the filter on the front end can also cause resonance and excite frequencies on the grid. So there's a lot of concern on how to apply these and whether you need to um, really understand the plant that they go into. It's not, you know, it doesn't happen often, but if it does happen, it creates a lot of issues. And these use these, um, these SGCTs, which are sometimes difficult to, to find. Again, there are not a lot of people making them. They're a complete unit, as you see here. So the current source inverters are extremely rugged. They're maintenance-free generally. They're short circuit proof um, without using fuses. They tend to be very fault tolerant, but they also pass any, any line transient right onto the motor. They don't isolate the motor in a case where you're using a transformerless design. So um, we're still using very robust elements. It has four quadrant operation, which means you can regenerate and break. Um, the power section is designed for maximum current utilization. So it does have a very efficient output. Unfortunately, uh, the, not unfortunately, but the disadvantages or the things that you have to be careful of is it, it can't provide continuous torque at standstill or low speeds. Because you're controlling current and you can't change current dramatically, it doesn't have very much dynamic performance. So if you have a step input or something happens, the drive cannot change the motor speed very, very quickly or change the motor torque, I mean, very quickly. The power factor and efficiency depends on the speed. So it decreases nearly proportionally with speed. So at 50% speed, you might be down around, you know, point, point 0.5, 0.6 power factor, which is, is difficult. And if you're going to get around that, you really need an active front end to control the DC link current and also to control or address this power factor and efficiency issue. Now the transformerless version of this is truly without a transformer as long as the input voltage and the motor voltage match. Um, it does still need an isolation inductor. So there's a large input reactor and input filters are required. The input reactor is about 80% of the size of an equivalent transformer that would be used here. So it's not like it's a big transformers replaced with a small reactor, it's quite large. Um, and this filters the line against the, you know, the changes, much like we do in a low voltage system, but there can be resonances in the supply network. So this is one of the analysis that have to be looked at. And uh, you know, if the plant changes, if something is changed in the plant grid, it can affect this filtering and uh, you can find yourself having some difficulties. Um, in the case of a line side grind, ground fault, the drive is stressed too. There's no isolation without that transformer. And then the other issue here is an internal drive fault. It depends on that reactor to limit the fault current. So, um, you know, the size of that choke is not really that much different than the size of an equivalent transformer. So when someone says it's transformerless, that's true, it's not a transformer, it's a, it's a choke, it's a reactor, but it's still a big magnetic device. So when you look at the efficiency of this system, there's really no advantage compared to other systems because you still, it's sold as if it's an efficiency advantage because we don't have a transformer but we do have a large magnetic device, which is fully rated. Um, the other issue here is controlling common mode voltage. It's difficult to do, and you have to be careful because if you don't control common mode voltage, you can get bearing currents. And the last thing I want to mention is cyclic converters. This is called a direct drive because it does no link capacitors or link DC link. It's directly coupled, it requires a separate motor. A cyclic converter is used in very, very special applications, sometimes in mining. Um, and uh, you will see it very, very rarely. We make one, uh, a couple other people make them. They're, you know, uh, rather a unique system. They're usually only operated at one frequency. Uh, obviously, you know, they, um, the input power factor is low. 
Uh, they have a lot of unique characteristics associated with them, but you won't see them. The only reason I mention it is because you might hear of a matrix converter, which I believe um, Yaskawa might be working on one. They have been for many, many years. Um, I think they're the only ones I know of who are working on a matrix converter, but it is a direct drive um, direct drive trans, uh, system. So it doesn't have a DC link. So we'll see if that happens you know, what comes out in the next couple of years. Um, but as the user, after looking at all those different topologies and kind of the history of it, as a user or somebody who's going to specify the drive, you know, it's interesting to know all these things, but at the end of the day, every drive manufacturer should be able to tell you that how their line side system, whatever it is, limits power line distortion it should, if it's a pulse count, they should be able to tell you how many pulses. And today, if it's, it should be generally 24 or higher. It should meet IEEE 519 at the input of their drive, regardless of you know where that is. And it should provide some manner of providing uniform power factor. On the motor side, it has to limit the harmonics so you can use an industrial grade motor. It should be able to, they should, everyone should be able to tell you how they eliminate bearing currents by limiting the common mode voltage. Everyone should be able to tell you what their peak voltages are so that they can protect your motor insulation, what the DVDT is so that they don't damage the end turn insulation. And I think everyone today has good phase balance. There could be slight DC offsets, but not enough to saturate anything and constant flux operation so you can get the torque you need. So those are driven by the uh, topology, but depending on how people implement it, you always wanna ask, well, okay, what's the overall system efficiency, if that's interesting to you? Because anyone can give you um, IEEE 519 distortion compliance, but they might have to add a filter which degrades the efficiency. Um, will the drive be able to provide the torque uh, that you need to accelerate or drive uh, or overload, that type of thing. Can you start? Generally, you will not have a starting problem with VFDs like you would with uh, a soft start. Can you handle overloads? Is the drive sized properly? Do you need regeneration, which means that uh, you have to have some kind of active front end or is there another method that can be used? Some of these things, some of these drives can be broken apart. You can have pieces in different places. You know, do you have a problem in the plant? Um, many times in some of these drives, you can put the motor up to two kilometers away. So you could put the, uh, I've seen these drives placed into real shoehorned into plants when in fact they could have been put someplace outside the plant and the cabling could be run into the motor um, if that makes sense because cabling is not cheap either. So size can be an issue in a retrofit, and how to do cable routing. And then there are a variety of methods to cool these, air, water, heat exchangers. So these things end up being process issues. We could spend an hour or so talking about any one of these. But these are the things that should be of concern. And no matter what topology you decide to use, and usually you're not making that decision, you're making it based on you know, a manufacturer and what he's presented, but he should be able to answer all these questions for you to make sure you're not gonna affect the line and you're not gonna affect the motor. And that box you put in, that big gray box is not gonna do anything uh, detrimental to either, either side and that it should be able to meet your process requirements. So I've run over a good bit. I'm gonna blame Marty for that because he took too long at the beginning. So uh, I hope there are <laughs> questions and I will be glad to take them. Uh, and I'm always available to answer questions, uh, technical questions. I cannot answer anything about pricing or, or, or uh, selling this. That's Marty's job, but um, I'd be glad to answer technical questions. Well, Mark, um, I should actually say, <clears throat> Professor Harshman, uh, <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you so much for that uh, rather extensive um, lesson in medium voltage VFD topologies. Uh, for those that hung with us, and frankly, there was a, a remarkable number that hung through the entire uh, presentation, we will, um, by all means, uh, send you a link so that you can review this information. It was sort of uh, a bit of a drinking from a fire hydrant experience. 
But nonetheless, I think you can appreciate the expertise and knowledge that Mark has gained over the, what'd you say, quarter century, made me feel old, uh, worth of experience <laughs> in the medium voltage uh, drive um, market space. If you have questions, um, we've had some with regard to a, a follow-up and, and being able to get a copy of this, by all means, we're gonna be sending out a link by tomorrow that will have a, a link to our YouTube channel where this presentation will be available for you to review or share with your, um, with your associates. So if there's any questions for those who have managed to hang on with us, um, please hit the Q&A and we'll, uh, we'll let Mark field them. Getting a lot of thank yous. We appreciate that very much. Well, like I mentioned, for those who are still on the line, we are going to have a second in the series of the of webinars. It's going to a, uh, take place on Tuesday at the same time. I promise we'll do our better job to try and, oh, we have a question, but let me finish that statement. I promise we'll do a better job of trying to adhere to the hour segment that we had uh, originally um, shot for. But uh, Mark, I have a question for you. Uh, would yep. you recommend running a VFD in place of a soft start in a large inertial starting load situation? Um, absolutely. I well, I, I guess I, I should qualify that. Um, as far as torque development and getting it started with um, with the least you know amount of um, current draw from the line. Usually, if you're using a soft start, you've got a line that uh, you know can't start the motor across the line. Uh, most soft starts, you know, I used to. I actually before this, I, I worked for Benchall, so I'm familiar with solid state starters. The drive will provide almost 100% torque to get started, whereas a soft start, usually they're going to be you know 25 percent torque because the least you can you know you usually are are trying to reduce the uh, inrush by 50 percent so um you can't it's tough to get much lower than that so the torque you're going to be av be av able to develop with a soft start is um a lot less it, it's a squared term so if you reduce the voltage by 50 percent you're going to get 25 percent current so uh, or 25 percent torque so you know that might not be able to get the motor started or worse you know you'll get the motor running up at, on a soft start you can get it running up to about 80 percent speed and you'll run out of torque and it'll sit there and stall um, but you won't realize it because it's still spinning until it trips on overload but um, for Torque availability, the drive provides the most torque to get things started. It can actually give you full torque, almost full torque, to get the motor started. Um, hopefully that's enough. Now the drive can be oversized to give you even more torque. So let's say in a mill application where you know a mill has been tripped and it's loaded, and now you have to start it. Now normally it might take, you know. 80% or 60% torque to get it started. But when it's loaded up like that, you might need 150, 200% torque to get it started. Well, the drive can be sized to provide that kind of torque. And the motor typically will do it because the breakdown torque is usually around 200, 220%. So the motor can do it. So, hey, Mark, um, yeah. The same customer um, actually interjected and he says his application would break the equipment with 100% starting torque. But uh, my understanding, and I'm sure you'll, you can expand on this, is the VFD's output can be torque controlled. Yeah, so we, we don't can. have to put out 100% torque at, no, you at don't. zero RPM. No, my point is that uh, you know you can get a hundred, you can get much higher torques from a drive with less current draw from the line on a you know than you can with a soft start. Okay, so you can set your star, soft start and say, okay, I want to get you know, 25% torque or 30% torque, and um, you're going to pull three or 400% current um, sure. starting. Uh, if you take a drive and say, I want to produce 25% torque or 50% torque, whatever it happens to be, um, then you're only going to pro you're only going to pull 50% of the rating. You're not going to provide. You know, you're not pulling 
600% sure. or 300% inrush. But to do yeah. that, a drive is much more expensive than a soft start. Just depends on your Yeah, line. that's it. Thank you, Mark. Um, that said, I just want to make sure the audience knows that Ponton Industries also has soft starts. So we can run the comparison for you between the advantages and disadvantages, price versus uh, inrush current and so forth for you. Um, we have another question. What's the normal efficient, uh, efficient percentage one should look for for a medium voltage VFD? Um, all in, meaning that, uh, you know, you want to go, you know, wire to wire. To wire. Um, usually you will see them anywhere from 96 to 97%. If you see those numbers, generally, you've got the, the the person has told you everything they have, transformer filters, whatever it is. Um, I've seen them as high as 97.3, 97.5%, but, but usually that requires some special designs on the transformers or some of the magnetics. But um, 96, anywhere from 96 to 97, uh, you've probably got everything that you're going to see. Uh, like I said earlier, if you see 98 or 99, they're giving you one part. And I have seen people, I've seen this in Europe more than anything, where they'll give you just the drive. And you say, well, do I need a filter? And they say, well, we'll yeah, but that's not included in this. And it might only be two-tenths of a percent or half a percent, but those things add up over time. Hey, Mark, uh, worth, worth mentioning on that same topic is the efficiency it varies over the load or speed, so it's um, it's a it's a multi-layered question that depends on the application and the and the speed of which that drive is going to push that motor. Yeah, usually where, the draw. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say that, and where you're going to spend a majority of your time with regard to process control at what speed. Yeah, um, usually the uh, especially if you have magnetics in there, the efficiency will drop a little bit, not by much, because things like core losses and things um, become predominant at, at you know, as your I squared R losses go down because you're not, you know, you're running at a lower speed and you know, um, you know, lower loads, uh, you will see the efficiency degrade at, at lighter loads and lighter speeds not dramatically, you know, maybe half a point if that, um, but you will see that in voltage source drives because sure. some of the other other factors become predominant at those ends. Well, we have, we have one last question that um, might take the next hour to answer, but nonetheless, I'm gonna throw it out there for us. Uh, we have a uh, participant from one of our refineries and he says, what is the preferred method of cooling Perfect Harmony drive installed inside a pressure uh, power center, power PDC, but it's pressurized. Um, well, the the drive will pressurize the uh, PDC naturally if you uh, just let it uh, circulate the internal air, uh, but that requires you to you know use HVAC to cool the internal air. Um, but that's the, I would say, the most expensive way to go because you need the HVAC to handle all the losses of the drives. But it, it does give you a pressurized PDC. The other way you could potentially do it was would be with an external air-to-air -air heat exchanger or air-to-water heat exchanger. Um, and uh, that would still... Uh, that would still allow you to pressurize the PDC. So there are a couple approaches you could take to that. And that doesn't, yeah, when I, I say air to air or air to water, it doesn't mean that the drive would be water cooled. It could be an air cooled drive and it can be a closed loop air, a closed loop air system or a closed loop air to water system um, so that you could still pressurize the PDC. Very good. Yeah. In fact, it, and we do want to mention that we do have, um, depending upon rating, a variety of means of cooling our drives, uh, the lower ratings, smaller horsepowers, if you will, typically are air-cooled drives. Uh, that still, to Mark's point, doesn't limit you to just air circulating within the enclosure where the drive is located. But at larger ratings, we have water-cooled, uh, where it becomes more effective and more cost-efficient to water-cool the drive with an exterior um, water-to-air heat exchanger. Um, we've got another question. Can you speak to coordinating drive DVDT and peak transient voltage with a motor manufacturer in a new application? Does it does a study need to be specifically, oh, I'm sorry, specified to vary compatibility, verify compatibility? Let me read that one more time for clarity. 
Can you speak to coordinating drive DVDT and peak transient voltage with a motor manufacturer in a new application? Does a study need to be specified to verify compatibility? Um, generally not. Uh, I think generally if you're, um, I guess there's a couple ways to look at this. If you are going to a manufacturer, whether it's the motor manufacturer or the drive manufacturer, and they are providing both the motor and the drive, then you have a right to expect that they figured out that they should work together. So they should coordinate the, the you know, the voltages, uh, the peak voltages and the DVDT. Um, now, if they, if if you have an existing motor or you're buying a motor or someone's buying a motor from, you know, let's say, you know, vendor A, and then you're buying the drive from someplace else, then usually um, if you ask the motor and drive vendor to work things out themselves, sometimes that works because, especially if it's just a motor vendor and they don't make drives, but if it's a if it's a motor vendor who also makes drives and they have to work with someone else's drive, you know, they're usually a little bit antsy about, um, you know, uh, giving information. But depending on the drive manufacturer, you should ask the drive manufacturer if he would do a compatibility report. And generally they will evaluate if you can give them the motor data, if it's existing, if it's an existing motor. Um, but if it's a new motor vendor, um, most new motor vendors will give you the data sheets, um, you know, that are being quoted. Uh, I can tell you that when you're coordinating this, if it's just uh, peak voltages, um, you know, I'd say you probably don't have as much of a concern if you're putting a 4,000 volt um, drive on a 4,000 volt motor, they're already pretty much coordinated with, with the insula insulation levels. The DVDT is another issue. The insulation, motor manufacturers want to, you know, be as cost competitive as they can. And one of the ways to reduce the cost of a motor is to reduce the insulation um, to the minimum you need. Uh, because as that gets bigger, as the insulation gets thicker, the windings fill up the slots and you might need to change the size of the slots in the stator, which could drive the motor to be slightly bigger and that it just cascades from there. And I will tell you, I've done a motor compatibility analysis uh, on a municipality, as a matter of fact, who was buying a very inexpensive Hyundai motor. And it's the only motor manufacturer I've ever seen who did this. Um, they, uh, they specified um, the typical DVDT on an industrial motor is about 5,000 volts per microsecond. So that tells you how sto how steep that line can be, you know, that the uh, the drive can, the motor can tolerate. Um, so some motor vendors, WEG, Hyundai, some of them will actually specify that, so you can see it in their data sheets. And I got a Hyundai motor once that um, that came in at 500 volts per microsecond you know, was on their data sheets. And I thought it was a typo. I thought it meant to be 5,000. And um, that is, it turned out it was a very inexpensive motor. And the way they were getting that was they were cutting down on the insulation. That particular motor could not be put on any drive manufactured today without a filter. Um, so typically the motors that you would buy as an industrial motor from, you know, uh, the big big houses in the US, they're going to be at, set at 5,000 volts per microsecond is the typical standard. And that corresponds uh, to a certain insulation level. So you don't have to worry about doing it. But it's always, it's always you can always ask the uh, manufacturer of the VFD to uh, do a compatibility study. I know we do that for free. Um, you know, at the proposal stage, if we can get the motor data. So, you know, if you're buying the motor separately um, or you have the motor already, if you can provide the data, we do that study for you. Um, if we're providing the motor, obviously we have it, so we can we can do the same thing. Um, hey, Mark, so, correct me. Yeah. I'm sorry, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, one of the data points we'll need in order to do that compatibility study would be motor lead length, would it not? We can include the motor lead length. It's usually not a big factor. Um, you know, we, we actually do worst case and we assume a certain amount of reflection. So we, we go conservative on that. Um, but if the motor's within, you know, 
you know, 7,000 feet, which it usually is, we usually don't have to worry about the cable too much unless somebody's doing something really unique with shielded cable. Well, I, I think to my point is that's unique to the cascaded H-bridge um, topology of the GH-180. Uh, other other topologies have lead length limits that are far oh, less. Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, you know, if you, um, if, if you, well, I, I guess to answer the question that was originally asked, I think it's legitimate to expect the manufacturer sure. of the drive to tell you that they're not going to have a problem. We're running a certain motor as long as the data is provided to them. And part of the piece, the piece of the data could be the lead length. Excellent. Um, that's the last of the questions that I, I see. I uh, want to thank everyone again for attending. Uh, we are going to have a second part to this series. Everyone that attended will get an invite. I do encourage you to um, bring a lunch next time and uh, and, and attend our, our second uh, webinar, which will be on Tuesday, July 14th. Uh, again, thank you, for, uh, thank you for your time. We really appreciate it. Oh, hold on, one more question. Thank you. Oh, okay, sorry, you're welcome. All right, guys. All right, take care, enjoy your... Um, Enjoy your day.